Good morning on this Sunday, October 15th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. Governor Brian Kemp orders flags be flown at half staff to honor the Americans killed in Israel by Hamas. The Atlanta police chief fires the officer involved in the arrest and tasing death of a 62-year-old church deacon. And Brookhaven breaks ground in a new city hall, and critics don't like the $80 million price tag. Kathy, Phil, Theron, and Martha are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. In an executive order, Governor Brian Kemp ordered flags at half staff in honor of the Americans killed in the terrorist attacks as, as he also announced his support and prayers for Israel. This as thousands rallied in Sandy Springs to show their support. A massive show of solidarity with the Israeli people this week in Sandy Springs. Inside the theater, every seat was filled from the orchestra to the rafters. Outside, Sky Fox 5 saw thousands more pour onto the lawn to take part in the ceremony. Know that all of us here in Atlanta are with you tonight. Among those mourned, an Israeli soldier with ties to Atlanta. Deco was a really amazing person inside and out. He died in combat during the attack. He fought until the last drop of blood was left of his life. Governor Brian Kemp and Senator Raphael Warnock filmed video messages to express their support. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens says his city stands with Israel against terrorism. It's important for us to remember that Hamas is not Palestine. Rather, it is a militant terrorist organization. Metro Atlanta's Jewish community turned out in the thousands to show they care. Sandy Springs Mayor Rusty Paul says they are one. There is a person here tonight who does not in some way have a personal connection to people living in Israel. Besides my sister city friends, we have people from here in Sandy Springs living there permanently. We mourn with our friends, our family members, our allies. <laughs> All the way from Atlanta, 6,000 miles or more away to Jerusalem. The organizers of the event say it's one they hope they never have to put on again. But they say Israel is at war and they will do what they can to defend it. So let's run the table on this. The images I, I know are just too horrific to describe from this week. Martha, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I turn on the TV like a lot of people did on Saturday morning. I usually check to see what's going on. And as soon as I started seeing the reports out, uh, I mean, I had to sit on my, my table and I started to cry because it just was too horrific to even imagine. And, and really, you know, the Palestinians, I think that Mayor Dickens did a very good job um, of saying the Palestinian people are not Hamas necessarily. And so that was, I think, an important distinction to make. And he did it in a very caring and, and, and tactful way. And I think it's so important that we, we remember this because this is horrible. This is killing people. And then in our own country, what we have seen since then, it is not peaceful protests of peace for Palestine or let's go through. It's gas the Jews and kill the Jews being said by people in our own country. And that was what was the most horrific that I had to deal with this week, seeing that in my own country. There, and it's disturbing for sure. Very disturbing. And, you know, I had an opportunity to really attend a City Springs event. And um, just shout out to the organizations that came together quickly to uh, uh, organize this event where you saw in your clip, Lord, thousands of not just Jewish people, I mean, people from all mm -hmm. over the Atlanta metro area. And the thing that was so uh, disheartening to me, as Martha talked about, is that when I talked to my friends, many of my friends are the Jewish community, they talked about how they're just waiting to hear from their kids or their grandkids, and then their grandkids are asking them questions, saying, you know, grandmother, granddaddy, why is this happening? Why are they killing us? Why are they attacking us? And so to, so to Martha's point, it's like, this has been going on for a very long time. I mean, you want to, this, this war that's happening and this terrorist attack is probably one of the most complex global issues that we're facing. And I was just want to praise President Biden and everyone that really came to the quick and swift sort of support of our brothers and sisters uh, in the Jewish community. And I think, you know, you're right. This is a terroristic attack. And what is happening to innocent children that are being killed, innocent people, is just horrific. And Martha kind of talked about this, but most Georgia politicians I saw expressing their support for Israel, condemning the attacks. Some members, though, of the so-called 
you know, squad, the progressive Democrats on Capitol Hill, called for an end to U.S. aid to Israel. And we saw similar sentiments, as you had mentioned, on some college campuses across the U.S. Phil. Well, that's the dark side of what happened um, last Saturday, um, and I agree with my colleagues uh, about the barbarity, and uh, Israel, yes, is a uh, outpost of Western civilization, and it's one of our top allies. And so, uh, to your point, though, Lori, uh, you saw even in front of the Israeli consulate in Atlanta, uh, not just Palestinians uh, protesting, but also Hamas and just ugly statements, uh, anti-Semitic statements, and, and calling for the killing of, of Jews. And so. Uh, um, sadly, you know, with our policies, we've let in uh, immigrants that have not assimilated to our culture. The uh, uh, Dearborn, Michigan, for example, has been taken over by Muslims who actually are praising Hamas at their city council meetings. So uh, I think it goes to security. Uh, Israel, you know, I've been there. Uh, you can fly over for just a, a minute, a little over a minute, and you can see how small a country it is. They're obviously worried about their security. We need to do all we can to, to stop the, the anti-civilization forces, if you want to call them that. And I think it also goes to uh, border security here in the United States. As I've said on this show, and many, many people have said for three decades now, you cannot have an open border. I Just before the taping of the show today, two Lebanese Arabs were grabbed by the uh, Border Patrol. We didn't know who they are. This, is, this has got to stop. Kathy, we did see a lot of Democrats come out and condemn some of these comments that were made by their fellow members of the party. Well, and, and well, they should. I mean, I think this is the time for us to be really united as a country. Our leadership needs to be united and focused. This is not a time for uh, politicizing an, an incredible tragedy all the way around. Um, and I think as you, we look at Washington and the division that's going on in Congress and the inability to get work done, these are the kinds of times when, you know, having that level of dysfunction is, is incredibly dangerous to our own national security, not to mention the stability of the world, not to overstate our importance in that in that play. And um, you know, I hope that the unfortunate situation that we're, we're faced with here, you know, brings people to understand their responsibility when they're in leadership. Yeah. And back here at home in the Georgia legislature, some state lawmakers are looking at banning Iranian businesses from doing business with the state of Georgia, Phil. Yes, I think that's a good idea. And uh, I think we have to be careful, too, uh, with another one of our enemies, China. Uh, we didn't get a bill passed in this last session of the General Assembly to ban the Chinese from buying farmland here in Georgia. Uh, I think that'll be addressed in, in January when the legislature opens. But we have got to emphasize our own national security. This is a wake-up call, like we were talking about earlier. It was a surprise sneak attack by barbarians, and we cannot have that here in this country. Well, I mean, and, and blame is for later, okay? Uh, but Mossad is who we go to when we need to find things out, and they miss this too. And it looks like it's been planned for a very long time. But you gotta look at the timeline here just very quickly. You had the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, and you know how they love anniversaries. In, in, in 1999, we were this close to Bill Clinton being able to negotiate a long-term peace agreement, and then the second intifada started. Now we had three weeks ago the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia saying we were this close to getting an agreement with Israel, and this happens. They don't want peace in the region. They say they might want peace in the region, and I'm talking about the terrorists here. They don't want peace. Darren, final thoughts. I mean, this this is this is something that again the relationship between Israel and the U.S. They're an ally, and to Martha's point, it also to me heightens the need for more national security and intelligence because we don't know what's going to happen, and 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 now Israel is put in a in a posture that they got to defend themselves, and so you can't blame them. I mean, they basically were attacked; they children were killed. They and it's been going on for a very long time. So I think that. Unfortunately, this is not the end of this. However, I think the U.S. will continue to stand by Israel and fight against these terrorist attacks. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks, folks. Up next, the Atlanta police officer involved in the arrest and death of Johnny Holman has been fired. We'll discuss next. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. 
According to the Atlanta police chief, the officer involved in the tasing death of an Atlanta church deacon has been terminated. The department says Officer Kieran Kimbrough did not follow the department's standard operating procedures during the incident by not calling for a supervisor. The attorney, though, for the family of Johnny Holman says they are deflated over the reason for the firing, demanding again the video of the arrest be released. They say when you see the video, your thoughts won't be where was the supervisor? Phil, to you first. Well, I have been supportive of Chief Darren Sherbaum because uh, I think he's done a lot to turn around things in the city of Atlanta since he became chief. But I disagree with him on this for several reasons. Uh, number one, I, we all, I thought on the panel, agreed that we ought to, the public ought to see the tape of this. It hasn't been released. Um, we don't know, for example, if, uh, if he was drunk. We don't know if a DUI test was administered. Um, we know, you know, his car was found with with uh, marijuana and 20 bags of some sort of drug and uh, a gun and all of that. But anyhow, uh, he's got one of the best lawyers in the business, Lance LaRusso. He defends uh, police officers. He's beaten the city on some of these firings before. Uh, obviously, the officer is appealing. And um, I think it was too much of a rush to judgment right now. And if you want to start recruiting law enforcement officers in Atlanta, this is not a good look. Theron, any insight on this or when the tape could be released? Well, so, so far, viewers, and the way I understand it, is that the chief made this decision. So that's the thing that I think that we need to understand. And while, you know, Mayor Dickens came on the Political Breakfast podcast this week with myself, Lisa Ram, and, and Brian Robinson, it really showed a level of sort of understanding, like, hey, we really want these officers to feel like they understand the protocol and they understand how they're supposed to deal with a person who refuses to sign a traffic citation in that moment. I think where it's going to get a little tricky is when, we got to see the video first. Mm -hmm. And and that so the video to me will you know, answer a lot of unanswered questions. But the policy that was in place is that whenever you get to a point where someone refuses to sign a ticket, you then are supposed to call your supervisor and that man or woman shows up. In this case, I don't know if the supervisor was called, but even if the supervisor was called, the uh, incident happened and then the taser uh, was involved. And then it's also whether or not the taser actually caused the death or was it something else. So I just think that Chief Sherbaum made this decision based on the evidence. They took the entire time to look at the evidence. But I think the tape is what's going to help uh, bring a lot of transparency and clarity to this. And then lastly, as I said before, no one should um, die in a traffic citation incident. Everyone deserves a right to sign it or not sign it uh, and go home safely to their families. Martha, then Kathy. Look, I am, as I understand it, at the end of every shift, they look at all the video. Whoever's the, the watch chief, I'm not sure exactly what the title is. They look at every video. And so they were aware of this right away. And I think that you're right that the chief uh, did make that decision. But I believe that he understands that it's going to be investigated. And there is a process that the video, the family's saying, and I understand how they feel, it should be released, but it can't be released till the GBI finishes their investigation. Right. So they have to finish their investigation first, then they can release the video. We had a similar situation up in Hall County from two years ago that just recently um, came to light because <coughs> of a lawsuit and the video, we learned about all these processes. So look, I'm willing to wait and see what happens. Kathy. Well, I think it's also important to note that the officer that was involved w was relatively young, been on the force about two and a half years, and, and had uh, his own vehicle accident and a number of citizen complaints against him. So we don't know what's behind. He was also a highly decorated officer. I'm not sure I'm aware of that, yeah, but yeah. let me just say, when, when you're looking at somebody's personnel file and other things that might be in the background, there could be other contributing factors uh, to the chief's decision and letting him go. All right, still more to come on that. This week, a federal court judge wrote a 62-page opinion saying plaintiffs in a case challenging Georgia's controversial new voting law did not prove the election law had a racially discriminatory motivation, allowing certain provisions to stand. Kathy, uh, your thoughts, are you surprised by this ruling? Um, well, I'm not surprised by the ruling because it's pretty limited. We're still going to have to take it to court and, un and sort of unpack it. And I'm not privy to the to the legal strategy behind what people are doing. But let me just say this: in in my experience with elections, with both th this law and other things that have happened, we really need the General Assembly to take a very, very close look at whether the things that they have passed have. Uh, achieve the desired objective. So when you look at voter challenges, when you look at the cost of elections, the cost of elections in Fulton County since Senate Bill 202 have gone up four times from about 
three dollars a voter to over nine dollars a voter now to two something to over nine um, that's not because anybody's having a real good time let me be really clear mm -hmm. this is for things that are mandated by these laws that that aren't getting to the heart of it when you have eight, nine, ten thousand voters challenged by one single individual and we have to stop all of the processes of our election board and our staff to address those kinds of things and yet nothing gets referred to the attorney general for investigation, you gotta wonder if you're just driving up costs and you know for a political reason. Well clearly Fulton County needed to spend more money on their elections because they had lots of problems and you did a great job in straightening a lot of that mm -hmm. out. But I you know I just love how we keep calling it controversial. When we've been through a couple of elections with record turnouts, we the only people that seem to be unhappy about it is people that have lost the elections and I thought we had a little problem with that in 2020 that we didn't like people that just lost elections to keep suing people. This law has stood up sure it's been looked at every time since it's been passed but this law has increased turnout more people have voted it's been easier for people to vote it's not controversial Theron, any changes that you think the General Assembly should look at? Well, we, to Kathy's point, we got to really take a deep dive and a true analysis on Senate Bill 202 and I still believe that the intent of that bill was when Republicans received a, you know a lot of defeats they put these voting restrictions and voting policies in place to basically make it sort of more difficult for people to vote that will ultimately sort of lead to, you know, what they call higher turnout, but ultimately, as Kathy just pointed out, it's putting this burden on these local counties to administer these elections. And so I think that you're going to see Democrats make a compelling case about has Senate Bill 202 really been working? And then some of the things that they propose, do we even need them going forward in future elections? Bill? Well, let's remember that uh, back in 2020, when you had the Secretary of State decide he was going to flood the state with 1.4 million absentee ballot uh, uh, forms, you knew that was going to be a problem. You knew there was going to be a problem with drop boxes. Uh, when I've talked to law enforcement officers, they were totally unguarded. So you're naturally going to have questions. And, and, you know, when you start yelling about, oh, this is racially discriminatory, you know what? Um, I, I, yeah, the losers don't like it, but the losers do have a, a right to ask questions. But to always hear the race card, it gets gets really tiresome. All right, we'll leave it there, folks. Coming up, the city of Brookhaven breaks ground on an $80 million new city hall, and some are questioning that price tag and if it's really needed. That's next. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. According to the AJC, a member of the Gwinnett County Rec Authority has resigned over the so-called Promised Land Project. Derek Wilson served on the board for more than two years, saying he is disappointed in how the county is handling the restoration of the former plantation house. The county brought, bought the property six years ago, and there's been little progress. They are in a little insight. We have discussed this before, but it seems to be ongoing. <laughs> Yes, it's ongoing, and I think that what's interesting here is that the Recreation Authority, uh, this gentleman, as you mentioned, was on the authority, but he was asked in August, uh, his name is Derek Wilson, he was asked by Commissioner Watkins, I think, who appointed him to resign in August. And the reason for the letter of resignation was because through his passionate sort of, you know, commitment to coming up with a, a long-term conclusion or a solution for a promised land, he was just disorderly. He was just very kind of aggressive in some of the conduct on the board. And again, it's not me saying this is what's in the letter. It's what kind of led to him ultimately coming off the board and now sort of raising a lot of questions that I think the county has decided to move towards eminent domain. Uh, my sources tell me that this is also uh, it is in the middle of a lot of political back and forth in Gwinnett. Um, and so there's going to be more actions, there are going to be more decisions that are going to be made with this. But ultimately, this was a classic case of a recreation authority, which is a separate entity than mm -hmm. the government, mm -hmm. uh, having a board member who wanted them to do something that they were not doing and therefore was asked to resign, but then later also resigned. Um, because he felt like the direction was not heading the right direction. Phil, you want to weigh in on this? Well, yeah, that was, that's some good perspective, but to give it some further perspective, let, the listeners need to know we're talking about the county wants to have 10 acres of parkland. That, that, that's what the whole thing is all about. And yes, there is, there is politics involved. Whenever you, of course, have eminent domain involved, uh, there's going to be controversy. So I, I think there needs to be more transparency here. The county needs to step up and say exactly what's going on. Well, the city of Brookhaven broke ground on an $80 million city hall complex this week. Mayor John Ernst 
saying this is more than just a city hall. It's a monument to the community. <laughs> the project is drawing its share of critics, saying it's just too costly and it's not even being built on land owned by the city. Rather, the city signed a lease with MARTA. Kathy. I just love watching all these new cities get upset when their people start spending money. You know, it, it, it's it's kind of interesting. I think, you know, what you can see in Chambly, they've just built a new one, and kudos to uh, made, uh, Mayor Brian Mock for uh, pulling that off on, on time and on budget. But you're seeing, you know, these cities are now moving into a more mature state, and they can't keep operating in the, you know, the back room of the 7-Eleven with their city hall meetings. They've got to have something, you know, real for people to rally around. So I, I expect people are going to be mad because they wanted a, a city that wasn't going to be spending any money but uh, here you go that's well, what happens well, in well, real we're, cities. We're proud of our Sandy Springs one because I know we all live in Sandy Springs well Phil and I you will be but um, <laughs> my business out there every week. But, don't you, but I mean look at I mean they had that big you know event um, yeah. for Israel so I mean the, these spaces do get used. Well we need well, to look at the, the city budget of Brookhaven probably number one I mean do you want to build up some sort of gigantic Roman temple type thing or you know, can the taxpayers afford that or, or should it be pulled back? Well, don't you think, though, people are kind of traumatized right now about any kind of cost for anything? I mean, I yeah. know that just I'm traumatized looking at real estate prices on a regular basis. We just built an $80 million hotel in Gainesville, Georgia, okay? I think that... <laughs> It's hard for people to see how much things cost, and that right now people are saying no to everything, but they shouldn't to this Brookhaven building. Baron? So full disclosure, I was <laughs> I was not going to involve in this, but I do represent, uh, do work in the city of Brookhaven, the legislature, and I think that you know it's good to hear you all's perspective. And I think Kathy sort of said something I want to go back to, and go and go back to what Mayor Rusty Paul said, and he said that all these new city, we all have our jewels, meaning mm -hmm. that if you look at the growth of North Metro Atlanta, particularly Brookhaven, which has balanced their budget, they've had a tremendous amount of housing there a lot of people live there because it's a great city to live in but this is just not going to be your average city hall I mean this is going to be a state-of-the-art city hall that's going to have a lot of community involvement they're going to have you know community space on top of it. it's going to be access to MARTA because we all talk about expanding transit here and so I think that these leaders knew that the price tag was going to have sort of a shock from the community but I think when you look at when this is completed in 2025 and yes is it is a you know a number that people sort of can debate on but ultimately I think this is a well-run city and and they've been very specific and transparent about the process. And we'll just, you know, I look forward to actually spending time there. Well, I would say the gateway to Brookhaven off of 85 and North Druid Hills needs a little sprucing up. It's so. true. <laughs> and look, and, and I, I look at the city hall that Brookhaven is in now. Yes, uh, I mean, I've been there, yes. You've been there. We, we've all been there. And so it, they need they, they need, need something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, the price tag can be debated, but they needed something nice. All right, how about a little good news, too? Georgia's graduation rate for high school students ticked up to another all-time high at 84.4%. 107 school districts posted graduation rates above 90 percent. Nice to see graduation rates heading in the right direction, Martha. Yeah, and I'm on the State Board yes. of Education, and I will tell you, we also scored higher than the average on the ACT, which was down because of COVID, and we're starting to see those school systems that stayed open mostly versus the ones that stayed closed, they're giving better results, and this is part of that results. Kathy. Well, I want to give kudos to the superintendent, Mike Looney, because I think he has done a great job. You know, he dedicated some of their COVID funds to doing small reading groups to bring kids' readings up, up Fulton, to level. Fulton County. Fulton County. Yeah. Yeah. What did I say? <laughs> no, you well, just you said, said the superintendent. superintendent. Oh, sorry. So yeah. Could have been Fulton County. Woods. Yes, yeah. Fulton County <laughs> superintendent. So sorry. Uh, is there another county? I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh, but, no. but anyway, I, I, you I'm know. insulted 158 people. I know, I know. I worked in other counties today. I just no, want to no, make that You clear. know, I just want to, I just, but I think it bears <laughs> you know demonstrating that focus and leadership really pays off and I think in this case he should de he deserves some credit for yeah, it. Yeah and they're getting bonuses like yeah. $90 bonuses yeah. and that's good. All right coming up winners and losers stay tuned. <laughs> Time now for the week's winners and losers. All right, Martha, we'll start with you. Yeah, my winner this week is, of course, Sandy Springs for that event that they threw in a terrible week. They, it was a bright spot. And I'm going to, I normally don't agree with Anthony Blinken, but I'm going to make him a winner because his story about mm -hmm. the people in his family who suffered from the Holocaust and other things and being able to say, I am not just the Secretary of State, I am a Jew, it was powerful.
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. um, to get outside of Atlanta for a second, I really want to give a shout out to city of Hampton, uh, who this week um, announced in Henry County they would soon be the home to a half a billion dollar Target distribution center. Mm -hmm. um, and also I want to give a shout out to the solar cell manufacturer, I hope I pronounced it right, Ceneva, mm -hmm. um, which is planning to reopen a factory in Norcross thanks to the legislation passed by President Joe Biden, your favorite Phil, <laughs> Senator Warnock and Senator Hawkboss, and then also the Braves. Um, great season, oh, disappointing loss. And Falcons, let's keep it up. We need a win this week. And go dogs, Phil. Go dogs. Right, go dogs. University go dogs. of Georgia on the way to the championship. Uh, also, condolences to the family of uh, Matt Towery, uh, the insider advantage, uh, Fox 5 pollster. Yes. He lost his mother last Aww. week, Joan Towery. She was kind of a matriarch of Vinings. My big loser of the week, though, are the four Democrats on the Cobb County Board of Elections. The, the lone Republican said, can we take a minute and do a Pledge of Allegiance to start things? They all said no. Now, come on, that's shameful. That, that shouldn't be happening in the United States of America. Kathy? Um, I want to give a shout out to the Atlanta Pride Committee. Today is uh, the big Atlanta Pride Parade. Um, it's 50 feet, 53 years running in this huge event that has great economic development, I mean, economic uh, impact. Uh, impact in Atlanta, and 53 years without without really any incidents, and uh, we know how to throw a good party. So come on out to the <laughs> Civic Center Marta <laughs> Station or the 10th Street Marta Station and enjoy the fun today. Awesome. Well, I just want to say, you know, we've been very blessed in the state to have some great first ladies, and this week I got to spend some time with the first lady who watches this show every week, oh, Marty yeah. Camp, working on some mental health issues, which she's very passionate about. She was a joy to work with, and um, I know she's a loyal viewer, so I know she'll ring us up when she's not happy with things. <laughs> anyway, everybody, make it a great week. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you again next week. Bye-bye.